be. And I've got to tell you that, I might have mentioned this the last time I was here, but I'm, um, uh, I'm not even cautiously, I'm recklessly optimistic. And I know that there are a lot of prognosticators who are suggesting that the church in America is quickly diminishing to where it's going to be a non-factor in our culture within a generation or two. Uh, and I'm just simply, I, I, just, I disagree with that. I, I do think in some ways the church has been pushed to the margins of our culture where it's no longer in control. And I actually think that's a blessing. Because I think when the church tends to try to shape culture through government, then what we're trying to do is use coercive power to teach a, pe a peaceable kingdom. Do, do you hear the conflict there? See, this has been the issue of what we've called Christendom all along. Christendom officially is when government and faith are trying to work together to provide a governance that's based on Christian principles and Christian power. But where the church has worked best through history, and even in today's world, do you know that the church, in terms of the Christian faith, is growing more rapidly today than it ever has? But of course not in what we call the advanced civilized world, or how we sometimes as sociologists call it the West. In the, in the cultured nations, Christianity is definitely on the wane. But in a, a lot of the Islamic countries, it's just amazing uh, how, thanks, it's just amazing how rapidly the kingdom of God is expanding. In China, some would speculate that there are more believers in China now than perhaps the rest of the world combined. Just a lot of people there. And there are tremendous uh, Christian uh, initiatives in nations where Americans can't even go, where there are missionaries sent from other countries. One of the uh, one, one of the most amazing missionary movements right now is coming out of Indonesia, where there are churches that are sending Indonesians in places where, again, Westerners could never go. And the church is expanding very rapidly. I think the difficulty for us is we live in a culture that continues to become more and more focused on self. And as we focus more on self, what that means is I don't have any responsibility toward anybody and I don't want to answer to anybody and that's the culture in which we live. And what I would suggest is rather than being discouraged by that, this gives the church a wonderful opportunity to say there's a better way to live. Now I've mentioned this before, but I mention this in most places where I teach and speak. Uh, each of us live in our own individual reality or story. Sociologists use the word story in this way to say that we organize our life and we each carry a story forward. And it's our personal story that gives us our name and it's unique to us. But we can't live there. We have to live in a larger story that gives our life meaning. And those are sometimes called meta narratives or large stories. But the truth is, everybody lives in a reality beyond themselves. And we call this also faith. Faith is that which you believe to be true, which gives meaning to your life every day. So you wake up to a particular reality that in a sense, stay with me here, in a sense, you choose. You have a choice of what you want to believe to be true, and your behavior will demonstrate what you believe to be true. And so I'm getting ready to start. I love this class that I get to teach in the spring called Faith and Culture. And basically what we start out with is taking a very careful consideration of the Christian worldview. I highly recommend a book written by uh, Goheen and Bartholomew called Living at the Crossroads. That's the, one of the texts that I use in that class. And what it does is it basically analyzes the culture in which we live and the culture that the church ought to be living in. And in a sense, it's like a crossroad where we as Christians are trying to live in this crossroad of a culture which is going in one direction and a church which is teaching us to live in a totally different way. And what we find out is that culture as it exists in America today and culture as it ought to exist in the kingdom of God are incompatible. And for too long we've tried to negotiate the difference. So we give a, a little bit of our life to this, a little bit of our life to that. And what I want to call us to is a deeper consideration of what would it look like to sell out to the kingdom of God. Because I'm convinced that Twickingham has its best years ahead of it if it chooses to live fully in the story of God. 
Now, I can be really brave today because, like I said, I'm leaving town, and what I'm going to is so chaotic that there's nothing here that scares me, right? <laughs> so I can just tell you what I think and what I believe to be true and what I think we as a, as a department of Bible and ministry at Lipscomb are absolutely committed to is to helping the church claim that story that Scripture says has been given to us by the King of Kings who came to this world, born in a manger, to become the true king of the universe. And if we believe in that story, then it changes everything about who we are, and it's learning how to see ourselves from the perspective of the kingdom of God that I think is so difficult. Because look, I enjoyed it as much as anybody. I actually tweeted this week that I have discovered that the joy of Christmas is expanded by the power of the number of grandchildren you have, and then I hashtag Christmas joy to the power of five. Because watching our grandchildren un unwrap presents and see the joy in their eyes over the box that the toy came in, right? Push the toy aside, play with the box. But it was still just a great day of rejoicing. Our family chooses to do the day after Christmas as Christmas because that way the other families and in-laws, it gets really complicated, doesn't it? But we had Friday together and just had an absolute time of celebration and joy. But I can't, be, I can't help but be struck by the irony of a child who was born in absolute poverty, and we celebrate it by giving lavish gifts to one another. Uh, and boy, I don't want to spoil that. I just want us to recognize that what we often do is we claim the story of Jesus without recognizing the profound nature of it. That you have this story that you would never expect to be true, and then you have this teacher who not only is, and you have to remember that everything that happens in the life of Jesus is very carefully thought out by the creator of the universe. Nothing happens by chance. Joseph and Mary didn't just happen to be in Bethlehem. God had Caesar call for a, a census to be taken so that Joseph, see Caesar thought he was in control in calling for a census, right? Now Luke tells us, nah, God used Caesar to get Joseph to Bethlehem because that's where Messiah was going to be born. And so this wasn't a, a lack of poor planning on Joseph's part. Everything happens as God had scripted it. And you look at the birth of Jesus, and it's the most unusual story that we have cleaned up into this wonderful quintessential Christmas card, which, by the way, I love the new trend in Christmas cards, right? Pictures of real people. Uh, if you didn't send out one of those, don't be offended. I'm just saying, it's sort of nice to get those one piece and we can hang them up and remember people rather than getting a card that says joy to the world and someone signs it, right? Well, but you look at that perfect Christmas picture, and what do you have? Help me out here. In the, in the picture of Christmas as we picture it, what do you have in the picture? Manger. All right, now, what is a manger? Feed trough, right? Have you ever seen a feed trough where cows eat that there's not cow slobber everywhere? But we clean it up and put really nice, clean, fluffy hay and make it look like a nest. That's not a manger. And most likely what this is, we talk about there's no room in the inn. You have Jesus who is born in, in a very common place. The word for inn there is not the same word that Luke is going to use later when he tells the parable of the Samaritan. The word for inn there likely means the place where animals are kept to heat up a house. In a common house you had one big room and you had a lower area where in the winter they actually the animals were let into the house to eat and sleep in the house, in, the, in an area of the house called the, the commonplace. And there was, if, if a person was wealthy enough, they had a little attached room for either the parents to sleep in or for guests. And that was called the inn in that word. So when there was no room in the inn, likely what that meant is Joseph's family was sort of like mine right now, 40 people in the house. Everyone's there for the census. There's no room in that private room, so the, the child is born right out in the middle of this area where cows eat. How unusual is that? And so the manger usually is, even then, was, were sticks placed together like this, hay's put in there, and because there was no room anywhere else, this little baby is, lap, is, is wrapped up in, by the way, not tied white, swaddling clothes, right? Now, when you look at that picture, it's always described the same. You have Mary, who's just given birth, and she just looks amazingly beautiful. I probably shouldn't have gone there, right? But I've been present for all three of my children's birth. As beautiful as my wife is, right after birth, she wasn't necessarily 
uh, ra you know, radiant. But here's Mary, just after giving birth, wonderfully smiling, and they, you know, all they got, they got the holy sombreros going on. You know the picture, right? And then you have Joseph who's standing up over. And then you have shepherds who are standing there, and you have smiling cows sitting. Clean sheep, come on. Who's ever seen a clean sheep, right? Or, and then, then, unexpectedly, you have the three wise men who don't really show up for three years. Or two years, anyway. So we bring them on in the picture. The birth star means they started their journey and probably didn't get there until two years later. Uh, and I still have a niece who, by the way, sets up when they set up their Christmas scene. She says, notice that the wise men are in the next room. She's got the story right. But what I tell my students is, look at this story. Because what we've done is we cleaned it up and made it something that we smile about rather than we look at and say, that is unusual. Because we've wanted the story to be comfortable for us. But the story as it's told, especially in the Gospel of Luke, is remarkably different from what we would expect. And I tell my students, you've got to understand that if you had a true Christmas card and it was scratch and sniff, it wouldn't be pleasant. Right? There's a point to that. And I know that this can get scandalous, but even the fact that Jesus was born to a young lady who was not yet married at the time when she conceived created scandal in Nazareth, which is likely why Joseph brought Mary with him and didn't leave her in Nazareth while he traveled to Bethlehem, because only the head of the household would have had to have been in Bethlehem for the census. But you don't leave a woman who is suspected of whatever with a young child. So the story, and shepherds, I mean, why shepherds? Do you know that shepherds, and there's, there's been some discussion about this, but I think that there's pretty good evidence that shepherds were not allowed to give testimony in court of law because they were known to be liars. And so who did God choose to give witness to the birth of Jesus? Those who would never be invited to a party, or certainly wouldn't be invited as credible witnesses. So everything about that story turns the life that we expect upside down to tell us that the things that we value, God puts no value in at all. And what's really unusual is the story, the unusual nature of the story of Jesus doesn't end at his birth. It just keeps getting stranger, doesn't it? Because when he finally starts his ministry at age 32 or 30, um, however old he is, he's worked for about 14, 16 years as a carpenter, which, by the way, likely he was a construction worker. Because Nazareth, we know now, was such a small village, it probably wouldn't have had a carpentry shop. But right down the hill was Sephora, a large Roman city that was being rebuilt from an earthquake. And there would have been hundreds and even thousands of carpenters framing doors as they rebuilt the houses. So I don't know if that changes your thought of Jesus, but he worked as a construction worker, likely, for 14 to 16 years before he began his ministry. So what does that tell us? He became one of us. So that when he began to teach us about the wisdom of God and showed us what it looks like for the word of God to be flesh, he wasn't that blonde, six foot five Norwegian with the white clothes and the beauty sash floating across the hills of Galilee, never touching the ground, saying, follow me. I don't know about you, but sometimes the way Jesus is depicted in movies just sort of creeps me out. I often, I often ask my students, if Jesus walked in the room, what would he look like? And I think he would be absolutely indistinguishable of anyone in our culture. Of course, he would not be wearing in our culture the long robe. I don't even know that he would have a beard. I don't think that's necessary. And it would have been in Jesus' time. I don't have a problem with that. But he would look like every one of us, any one of us. But I think what would make the difference is after he walked in, after a while, you would recognize the remarkable nature of this man who by his very nature is there for you. What I mean by that, I don't know if you've ever been in an environment like this. Maybe it's just me that it happens to. But you've been in a group of people and someone's talking to you, but they're looking over your shoulder for someone more important. Know what I'm talking about? It's like, excuse me, am I bothering you? Could I have your attention for just a minute? The thing about Jesus is when he was there, he was fully there, no matter who you were. He gave you his full attention. You could be an adulterous woman who'd just been caught and was being accused, 
and in, in the threat of death. And he gave her his full attention. Or you could be Zacchaeus, the little tax collector who didn't want to be in the crowd because that's a bad place to be when you're a chief tax collector and especially when you're vertically challenged, right? I'm trying to use politically correct language here. This little guy in a crowd, boom, oh, I didn't see you there. So he climbs up a tree and Jesus calls him by name. I'd still love to see that scene. I'm guessing he almost fell out of the tree. But he was fully present with Zacchaeus. And what strikes me is that Jesus didn't even have to preach the message of the kingdom to Zacchaeus. He had heard it before. That's why he wanted to see Jesus. And so he immediately said, Jesus, I get it. I'm going to give back everyone that I've cheated four times over. I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. And it doesn't take an accountant to recognize that what, what Zacchaeus is doing is divesting himself of everything he has because he's now claiming a better story. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to your house. So it's just one of those odd stories, one of many odd stories where Jesus turns our expectations upside down. I think perhaps some of us would have been as puzzled as his disciples when the rich young ruler came and fell at his feet and said, good teacher, what must I do to have the life that you're offering? And he said, okay, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? But understand in the Jewish mentality, what he's saying is, I want the story that you're living in. I see in you the life that I want, and I actually should have. Good teacher, tell me how to have the good life. Which Jesus says, don't call me good. Only God is good. And this is not a bad day for Jesus. What he's doing is he's saying this. He's saying, I'm not going to play word games with you. I'm not going to give you a soft answer. If you want goodness, you will only find it in God. And so let me tell you what you need to do. Follow the law. Well, I have all my life. I've, I've followed the law, and and I've got all this stuff, and, I, and I've been religious. And you know the disciples are standing there watching this going, that's what I want to be. I want to be young, I want to be powerful, I want to be rich. This is what everybody wants. And so Jesus says, ah, one thing you lack. And when we look at that, we sometimes say, is that what we have to do? Do we have to give up all our stuff? And the challenge is, Maybe. Because if there's something that you love more than Jesus, you're going to have to give it up or you'll never find the life that he offers. That's the key. What I want to challenge you to think about is personally, and then what I want to do during this lesson this morning during worship is challenge you as a church to ask the question, what would it look like to sell? And some of you know this, you're already doing this, so I'm not suggesting you aren't. But as a church, what would it look like to sell out fully to the life that Jesus offers? And the first thing would be what Jesus tells this rich young ruler, whatever it is that is attracting your life instead of God, get rid of it because it will destroy you. So Jesus didn't say, sell your stuff, give it to the poor, and you will have the life you're looking for. I mean, sometimes we get caught up in the idea of social justice giving life. Social justice is important, but it in and of itself will not give life. It's following Jesus that gives us life. But the question is, do you have things that you love more than Jesus? Because if you do, that's an idol, and you've got to get rid of it. What Jesus said is, if you want to have life to this rich young ruler, you've got to follow me. But right now, you can't follow me because you're following wealth. And as long as you follow wealth, you can't follow God. So if you're pursuing wealth instead of pursuing me, you'll never find the life you're looking for. So get rid of that. Sell it to the poor and then come follow me and you'll find that life you're looking for. And the rich young ruler turned him down. To which the disciples, again, very perplexed, they're looking at this picture and it's as strange as the birth of Jesus because what Jesus should have done, he should have said, you're a fine young man. You're exactly an example of what God intends for life to be. You're wealthy, you're religious, you're young. Now, what you really need to do to have eternal life is to bankroll our journey. You need to become our sponsor. This is what the disciples, I think, are thinking. Here's our opportunity to cash it in. I mean, the kingdom of God is coming. In their concept, it was going to be an earthly rule. The Romans were going to be defeated. They needed financial resources. Here is a perfect candidate. And Jesus turns them away. And they're perplexed. And Jesus turns and almost mumbles, how difficult it is for the rich to find life. In fact, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle. By the way, if you've heard that explanation, then what that means is a camel, when it's fully loaded, can't get through the gates of Jerusalem, and there's an eye of a needle, a small gate to the side, and he has to take off all his stuff. And 
That comes in about the fourth or fifth century. It's the first time we see Jesus' teaching explained that way. That wasn't an idiom during the day of Jesus. What Jesus is doing is he's using hyperbole to say, big mammal, little hole, eye of a needle. There were needles in Jesus' day. He says it's easier for a camel to pass through that eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to find the life for which he's been created. Why? Because riches pull us away from trusting God. That's the issue. That's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't trust both God and, well, King James gets it right, mammon. I like that because I have no idea what it is. I am, I'm not going to trust no mammon, are you? Well, what mammon means, it doesn't mean wealth. It means the system in which you place trust in wealth. So it's more than just wealth. It's the idea of who do you trust? Because whatever it is that you trust is what's going to be the pursuit of your life. And my observation has been, and again, this is not indictment, it's just simply observation, is that most of us never find the life for which we were created because we spend our lives accumulating things that will not give us the happiness that we all seek. And the world that we live in is clearly living this out right now in ways of personal choice that, that, that offend each of us and every one of us but the difficulty for the church is we live in a culture where the world is saying we want what we want. It doesn't matter how God has designed us in terms of gender. It doesn't matter what God has designed us in terms of the kind of relationships he wants us to have with one another. It's all about me getting what I want. But if we're living in that same story, how can we call the world to another story? Does that make sense? Now, it may be that in our world we know that there are certain things that are wrong, and we say that's wrong. But are we living out our covenant of marriage in such a way that we're showing the world what it means and what it looks like for a man and a woman to truly give themselves to one another for the glory of God? Or are we simply in convenient relationships where we're using one another for our needs and to procreate and to have a place to come to at home do you hear what I'm saying? There's a, there's a deeper theology of marriage that we must explore before we can tell the world about gender and the appropriate use of sexual orientation. I'm trying to be careful here. Stay with me. I don't know that we have a moral standing to tell the world what ought to be when we're not necessarily living out our marriages as God intends for them to, to actually become one. Are we living that out? Because until we are selling our lives out to one another for the glory of God in our marital relationships, we have nothing to offer the world. There's a really good book written years ago by Trevor Longman, Tripper Longman, called Intimate Allies. And I find it to be a very compelling book about what the marriage relationship ought to be. The idea that my responsibility, more than anything else, is to look at Rebecca, who is my wife, who God has created with spectacular gifts, and I've got to do everything I can to encourage her to maximize her gifts to the glory of God. And I'm so thankful that she has made the same commitment for my sake. And that then, too, become one. And I'm not saying we're the exemplary marriage. I'm just saying that even in our crazy youth, we understood that the most important thing is that we would love God first and then love one another to God's glory. So we have this wonderful opportunity to live in the story where Jesus says, ultimately, this, this, is, this, is the, this is the central teaching of the Christian faith. You were created to give your life away. And Jesus came to show us exactly what that looks like. And so I appeal to, and I'm going to mention this again in the sermon, because I know that there are some that will, are not here yet that are coming, and I just think this is so significant. It's so basic, but we need to remember this. There is clear in the, clearly in the scriptures, there is this theology of what I would call creation. And that when we recover the entirety of this meta-narrative, the big story, what we find out is when we live in that story, it looks much different than the story many of us are choosing to live in today, which is sort of um, an interesting result of the enlightenment where we've been taught to live in the world and then go to church on Sunday. Now we know that as we live in the world, we can't do some of the things the world does, but we live right up to the edge of it. Now again, this is just observation. This is not indictment. I don't know many of you well. Some of you I do. But for the most part, I'm just observing. 
that in our churches we have people who are living in the story of the world six days a week and then coming to church on Sunday in anticipation of going to heaven when they die. And they're missing the point of the invitation of Jesus to new life. Now in the end, will God save you by His grace? Well, that's His call, not mine. But what I'm discouraged is that, that those of you who are living in the world are missing the point of what life could be. Because you were not created to consume, you were created to give. Now, consuming is God's gift. He's the one who provides for us, and He wants us to flourish, but not to the expense of not trusting God. Do you think, and I, I wonder sometimes in our prayers, thank you, God, for letting us live in such a wealthy country where we have everything that we need. Are those God's blessings? Would God bless us with things that cause us to trust Him less? Or would God bless us with currency that can only be spent in Satan's store? And then, when things afflict us and we suffer, we wonder why God has abandoned us, when the truth is that may be His greatest blessing. I'm guessing there are many of you in this room that could say amen to that. That it's in the moment of our greatest pain that we experience the greatest birth as we reorient our life around that which truly matters. And so Jesus invites us to this whole new kind of life, and when it comes down to the most central point of his teaching, he reminds us what this means, that God created us and gifted us with amazing gifts for the purpose of distributing them to those who have need of those gifts. By the way, that's the meaning of the word ministry. The word diakonos, we know that when we get the word deacon, but the word means to minister and we've often said, well, what that means is that's a diakonos is a table waiter. Well, a table waiter might be expressing that, and it's not a bad way of thinking about it, but the word itself means to be a go-between. That is, someone is giving you something for the sake and the purpose of distributing it. So when we talk about giftedness, here's, here is what I'm trying to have my students understand perhaps more than anything else, is that they have been created uniquely in the image of God to take what God has given them and distribute it to those who need it to make the world a better place to God's glory. And that includes everyone. And I would love to see a church that would embrace this vision, that there is not one more important than another. There are different gifts within the body, and we need to distribute them appropriately in terms of, of how we use them. But I, I know churches of great numbers who basically are nothing more than a mouth that is a preacher everyone else is a spectator okay we would call that a really unhealthy body if all you had was a mouth now what paul presents in in particularly first corinthians and i can take you to ephesians chapter 4 there's that wonderful picture if you read ephesians 4 what 7 through 15 perhaps the most complete picture of the church in action, where he says that God has gifted the church for the purpose of having apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, that they might equip the members of the body for ministry. That's the purpose of leadership. And I think our current, and that's what I want to challenge you, I think times of transition are wonderful because you can rethink these things. And we're trying real hard. By the way, I wanted to mention a couple things before I forget them. Uh, a couple of dates I'd love for you to mark down and think about. Uh, March 9th and 10th, we're restarting the Institute for Christian Spirituality that I initially founded about five years ago. And it sort of went in a direction that I didn't want it to, so I withdrew. And we have a new dean, uh, Dr. Leonard Allen, who's doing marvelous work. And he's breathing new life into this idea, and I love it, is that the Institute is basically going to be a gift to help churches find their way. And to that end, John Ortberg is coming in on March 9th and 10th. If you don't know John, he's an amazing speaker, a great writer. Many of you have benefited from his books. But he has a new book coming out that has to do with understanding how God is at work in the world so we can join him there. And I think it has real hope. It's going to help our students a lot. But we have this nurture conference March 9th and 10th, which is an unusual time. It's, it's Monday, and, Monday night and Tuesday. But on Monday night, John will give a large speech in our Collins Auditorium. I mean, it's a, it's a great, it'll be a present presentation to a large group, and there's no cost involved there. The next day, we have a workshop for most of the day where John is going to be speaking several times, including at our, our chapel. 
Uh, but in the afternoon, we're going to have sessions to show you these new op offerings for the church. I'm going to be responsible for a module on the missional church and helping develop leaders that are actually focused on developing the talents of their members to the glory of God. So this is the work I'm doing now anyway. It just gives me an opportunity to do it in a little bit more organized offering. Uh, Dr. Briley, uh, who has got his, not only his, his uh, PhD in Old Testament, but he now has an advanced master's in conflict mediation. He's starting a whole sector of study to help churches resolve conflict. Uh, Holly Allen, Leonard's wife, is pr perhaps the leading expert in children's uh, spiritual development. She's written several books that are very well known. She's going to offer a module on the spiritual development of our children. And so what we're trying to do is to say, we're not here as a university just to teach our young people. We're here to explore and research and help churches become more alive in this story. So that's March 9th and 10th. I would love to have some of you participate in that. And then uh, April 22nd and 23rd, Scott McKnight, a good friend of mine uh, who's a prolific writer, is uh, going to come and talk about his book, Kingdom Conspiracy. And I had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago to go to Chicago and be a respondent on a panel responding to this newly written book. And it was such a fascinating experience. We had over 100 people in the room, and these were leaders of churches all over Chicago and some people from as far away as um, Oklahoma. But they were people of all different churches, different faiths, all the Christian faith. It was fascinating to me to hear this discussion about returning the responsibility of God's purposes to the local church. That's what this book, Kingdom Conspiracy, is about. And, you know, he's saying we can't find ourselves getting lost in social justice and miss the gospel. And so, there, you know, social justice needs to be a part of that. But we have a lot of our young people, and I understand why. Stay with me here. They don't want to go into ministry. It's too hard. And so they want to go in and start their nonprofit organizations that feed the poor because they want to do something significant with their life. I understand that. But I think it's essential that we don't give up on that in the church. We need to be giving our young people all the opportunities they're looking for to feed the poor, but in the name of the kingdom of God. Amen on that one? Amen. And what I'm finding, and I'm finding more and more research, and it's becoming more and more convincing. Some of you follow me on Twitter know that what I've found in asking my students, what is it that keeps you from coming to church? And here's their answer. And you can say, oh, that's not true. I'm telling you, this is what they tell me. We want a significant role in the church. And the church that I attend is offering me nothing to do. And if I want to do anything, I have to ask permission. And the likelihood is I'll be turned down or the elders, well, should I even go there? It becomes something that's rolled forward. We, you know, we used to talk about sins being rolled forward. Now we just have agendas that are rolled forward. Uh, I thought that'd bring some laughter. Anyway. <laughs> Now what I'm saying is we just don't get things done. The church becomes a bureaucracy that controls behavior instead of free, giving freedom to express who Jesus is through us. And I think we need to create an atmosphere that allows for failure as much as for success, but give people an opportunity to express their giftedness to the glory of God. That, I think that's what everyone wants to do. They just don't know it. And so what they end up doing is taking all the creativity that God gave them when God created them and spending it on a vocation instead of on the kingdom of God. And those aren't incompatible. What I'd love for you to see is whatever it is that you do best is God's gift to you to make the world a better place. I'm asking you to do it in his name instead of your own. Be more intentional about saying, this is God working through me, so I don't care if you're an accountant, a lawyer, a school teacher, all of those vocations are wonderful ways of expressing the work of God in the context of a broken world. And it's different, and here's how. Here's the basic teaching that I dropped a moment ago, I'm going to pick it up. Here's the heart of the Christian faith. You remember Jesus had allowed his disciples to go out and have the power to cast out demons and heal and they're all coming back from that, and they're so excited. And Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And what did people say? John the Baptist, prophet. John the Baptist raised from the dead. There, there's a tough one, right? A prophet. This and that. No one's saying Messiah. Why? Because Jesus wasn't saying the right things. He was doing the right things. He wasn't saying the right things. Because what Messiah was supposed to say is, destroy the Roman Empire 
And the Jews are once again going to be the ruling nation on Mount Zion. And what Jesus was talking about was giving your life away. And that's the way he was living. He was paying attention to the socially marginalized. He was healing the blind who in, in that culture had no value. He was blessing children. Come on, what's that about? He was demonstrating a way of life that they just, just didn't make sense to them. So he says, okay, but you, who do you say that I am? Ah, you're the Messiah, Peter says. And Jesus says, okay, you understand, but let me explain to you now what that means. It doesn't mean what you think. Because this is the first time that Jesus announces he's going to be crucified. And Peter says, no, you're not following the script. The script is you're going to be crowned king and we're going to be your ruling authorities. That's what we've given our life to. And Jesus says, and here it is, I, this is what I need you to hear. This is the story that we all need to hear. Jesus says, you don't understand. If you want to find life, the only way you can is if you help me. What's the first thing? Deny self. What's that mean? It doesn't mean to deny the value that you have. It means to deny the ego that would misuse the value that you have. When Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, that's what he means by denying self. Is Christ living in you? I just read a book this week. It's really well written. It's called... Uh, Jesus um, continued. Jesus continued. Just came out. And here's the, here's the thesis of the book. Stay with me. This is really important. We'll come back to it during the sermon. Jesus in you through his spirit is better than Jesus beside you in the flesh. Hear it again. Jesus in you through his spirit is greater than Jesus beside you in the flesh. That's what he promised his disciples in John. He said, it is, it is better that I go. Because when I leave... I will place my heart in every one of you. That's us. We're in the privileged position of having the Spirit of God within us, but the Spirit of God will take you nowhere as long as you're in control. So as long as you control your story and you're spending your resources based on what's best for you, then you'll never find the life for which you were created. So here is the invitation, and then we'll pray and be finished with this part of our lesson this morning. Until you die to self and pick up your cross, and by the way, picking up your cross, I believe that that is the philosophy of life that Jesus was advancing. It's more than that, but it is at least this. That is, until you're ready to give your life away for the sake of others, you will not find the life that you're seeking. So you get rid of the ego, take on this new way of life, and then follow Jesus. That's the invitation, follow Jesus. But you can't follow Jesus and be directed by your own ego. You can't serve God and self. So what does it look like to give yourself fully to the kingdom? That's why we need community. We need to talk to one another honestly. We need to help one another recognize that there's this better story of giving up our prerogative of life for the sake of simply living for the good of others in every vocation. And here's what happens. Jesus says, for those of you who seek to save your life, what? You'll lose it. But if you'll lose your life for my sake and the good news of the kingdom of God, you'll find it. So here we are at the beginning of a new year. Let's covenant with one another to give this thing a shot. That's what baptism is all about. It's about giving up our life in order to be reborn into a whole new reality. And it doesn't happen that fast. We wish it did. That's why you need community to help us refine the story and to become fully that which God created us to be. Let's pray. Loving God, for this amazing opportunity to think about our lives under your full direction, to think about the Spirit of God that is in each one of us, taking control. But I think in our culture that's so difficult because we've been taught to be self-directed. So, Father, we need wisdom, and this church desperately needs your presence in all of its decisions as all of us need. And so I pray that you would guide our steps so that we might learn what it means to surrender for the sake of recovering that which you've created us to be. It's in the name of our Savior that we pray. Amen. Thank you.